which is clear politics. Hello, the closer we get to November 5th, when the American elections will take place. The more the competitors' battle resembles American movies. There are intrigues, shows, and strong words so far without physical violence, but already with shootings. In general, everything for the viewer. The situation in the land of the brave changes literally daily, but we decided to take a deeper look at the biographies of the two main, main candidates and recall the notorious electoral system, which is very hard to call democratic. We provide only the facts. You draw the conclusion. Donald Trump turned 78 this year, which is three years younger than Joe Biden. And this battle of the gray-haired would have continued if the current U.S. president hadn't played his last card, announcing that he is retiring for the sake of democracy and the people. Of course, the media writes that he was forced out. And Kamala Harris, 59, took Biden's place. The main hope of the Democrats for at least some decent result in the elections. But who is Harris and why is she the number one face in the donkey party? The 49th vice president of the USA, Harris was born in California. Her parents were scientists. Young Kamala, according to her official biography, experienced busing. This was part of segregation when black students had to sit at the back of the buses. But the most famous story from her childhood is this one. In the 60s, my parents took me to demonstrations in a stroller without special restraints. At some point I fell out of it. Mom and Dad didn't notice and kept walking. When they realized I wasn't with them, they came back and saw me crying. Mom asked, Kamala, what do you want to calm down? I replied, freedom. Agree, such an episode is a trump card for a politician. But Harris didn't just make it up. She stole the story from a 1965 interview with civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. Harris stole the story from Martin Luther King's interview. The activist told a publication about an incident in Birmingham, a white policeman approached a little African-American girl who was marching with her mother and rudely asked her what she wanted. The girl looked him in the eye and said, freedom. Harris refused to comment on the situation, further convincing her opponents of its truth. However, the minority theme is central to her biography. She graduated from two universities, Harvard with a degree in political science and Hastings with a law degree. Both universities are notable for their quotas for black students. Harris's political career started in 2003 when she won the election for San Francisco district attorney. She became the first black woman to hold such a position in California. In the future, this would work against Harris. Liberals in the 2020 elections would call her a cop, a law enforcer in a skirt. But there were decisions in her career that reduced her popularity even among tough-on-crime supporters. For example, in 2004, she refused to seek the death penalty for a gang member who shot a police officer, enraging his colleagues. She couldn't gain points with death penalty opponents either. As California Attorney General from 2011 to 2017, she appealed a state judge's ruling on the unconstitutionality of the death penalty in 2014. A year later, she again fell out of favor with those advocating for more police oversight, 
by opposing the creation of a special prosecutor to investigate police use of deadly force and opposing body cameras for all California police officers. In 2017, Harris was involved in interrogating officials suspected of corruption, and in 2020, she decided to run for president, but failed. The fact is, supporters couldn't understand what her platform was. By the way, even now there's no clear agenda. During her first presidential run, Harris lacked support among her potential backers, investors, and a program. Now the situation is more favorable for her because she had to compete within the party with what can be called a walking dead man. She is now the only technical and methodical candidate who could really replace Mr. Biden. Harris's convoluted speeches cost her support. A couple of months before the Democratic primaries, her approval rating was 3%. On August 19, 2020, she joined Biden's team. Hello, America! It's an honest honor to speak with you today. Harris is the first black vice president of the USA, but within her first year in office, she alienated many Americans with a typical liberal agenda. Harris is a staunch supporter of same-sex marriage, the legalization of light drugs, and open-door policies for illegal immigrants. She advocates for tougher relations with China and a more significant role for Washington in the Asian region. Much of the current situation around Taiwan is her doing. But this cost Kamala nearly 20% of her support. At a meeting with the South Korean president, Harris shook his hand and then wiped it on her pants. Americans note that if Harris were a Republican, she would have been immediately accused of racism. In any case, the U.S. vice president demonstrated a complete lack of basic etiquette and politeness, many of her compatriots note. Some ironically ask if Seoul and Washington are still allies. Harris's behavior in general, to put it mildly, surprises and disheartens many. By the way, Harris was one of the initiators of Trump's impeachment in 2019. The businessman politician hasn't forgotten this. At rallies, he calls the vice president a liar and questions her abilities. There are people with high IQs in this room. I'm running against someone with a low IQ. I'm talking about Harris. I won't even mention Biden. You need to open your eyes. You need to see what's happening. We need to run the whole country. And the problem is that Kamala is even worse than Joe. These frames effectively made Trump the winner of the presidential election, while Joe Biden was still in the race. After Harris entered the game, the votes split almost evenly. However, the businessman's supporters are confident he will win and shake up the Western nest. Trump announced his intention to review U.S.-NATO relations and America's contribution to the alliance. Under him, the era of European security relying on the U.S. might come to an end. Moreover, Trump stated he aims to end the conflict in Ukraine quickly, which will likely result in ceding territory to a strengthened and emboldened Russia. Surprisingly, while Trump is known as a politician in our country, in the U.S. since the 80s, Donald has been not only a businessman but also a showman. In 1988, he declared on a TV show that he would definitely be president in the future. Back then, it was taken as a joke. 
On Oprah Winfrey's show in 1988, Trump praised presidential candidates George H.W. Bush. Bush, Michael Dukakis, and Jesse Jackson complained that Japan was beating the United States and stated that, although he did not plan to run for president, he did not rule it out and would probably win if he did. I'm really tired of seeing what's happening to this country. Thanks to us, others live like kings and we do not. By the way, Trump is a descendant of German immigrants who came to New York in the late 19th century. And Donald was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His father was a successful businessman in real estate. Trump is a descendant of self-made immigrants. He embodies the so-called American dream where they came to the continent, built their business, and passed it down. He has money, a woman, many children. He has many ventures. He's a public figure. For the classic American who wears a hat, has the right to bear arms, and sees his country as great, created by the Founding Fathers, Trump is indeed his candidate, the embodiment of his dream. But Trump had no shortage of talent. By the mid-80s, the businessman owned a good half of Manhattan. He bought a football team, started producing alcohol, built casinos, and did many other things. In 1986, Forbes estimated Trump's fortune at $700 million. However, in the early 90s, he fell into a financial pit due to the construction of the Taj Mahal Casino. The project cost Donald $1 billion. But a year later, it was not only completed but also started making huge profits. Since then, Trump's opponents have called him a fraud. Democrats still use this against Trump. They say he presents himself as a successful businessman, but is actually broke. They even predict bankruptcy for the 45th president. And let's not forget the fraud case. On February 16, 2024, a New York court fined Trump $355 million for financial report manipulations. The financial schemes trace back to the Taj Mahal casino construction. Throughout most of his business and political career, Trump believed that written rules didn't apply to him. In this case, he might also find that he can ignore the law and avoid punishment. The fate of his business, though close to his heart, doesn't seem to directly affect his political fate. However, while Trump has survived serious business struggles, his empire now faces perhaps its greatest threat. He might lose it. If you really want to see something, look at what happened. Here we come to the notorious earshot. After the failed assassination attempt, the scandalous politician's rating reached 47%. Harris has 46 points. Naturally, this led to rallying around him. But given Trump's high disapproval rating, which the Democrats are now playing on, they are trying to downplay the assassination attempt to prevent these sentiments from spreading among swing voters, and especially Democratic voters. We see that some big tech leaders who previously supported the Democrats have openly sided with Trump after the assassination attempt, even though they sponsored Biden in the last election. So we see certain processes, but it's too early to say that the boost guarantees Trump a victory, given his high disapproval rating and the Democrats' attempts to play a different card, portraying Trump as an old candidate like Biden, while Harris is undoubtedly younger, and they will try to contrast her with Trump. Roles in movies like Home Alone, his TV show The Apprentice, the sex scandal with porn actress Stormy Daniels, and the fraud case haven't killed Trump's popularity. For this, he was even nicknamed Teflon, meaning unbreakable. But is this enough to beat the Democrats in the election? In an election where not only dead souls and mail-in voting, but also electors decide everything. Let's talk about them. The final part of the US election takes place in two stages. 
The first, as we said, will be on November 5th. These elections are called general. All adults participate, just like in Belarus. However, you can vote by mail even from another state, which is considered one of the main problems. In 2020, the number of dead souls and fraud reached its peak and led to the March on Washington. We remember the 2004 elections when in Ohio, right during the vote count, the ballot counting system crashed, and then when it started working again, Bush Jr. pulled ahead of the then Democratic candidate John Kerry. Many Democrats also believed that there were some manipulations with the honorary vote in one particular state, Ohio. And of course, the last series of elections in 2012, when Republicans were outraged that Democrats were stuffing mail-in ballots. The same thing happened in 2016. And of course, the culmination of all this was the 2020 election where Democrats were actively criticized by Trump supporters for stuffing a lot of mail-in ballots in several states. And then the most mysterious and incomprehensible part of the elections, the Electoral College vote. It consists of 538 people representing each state and the District of Columbia, where the capital Washington is located. Each state has its own number. For example, Texas has 55 while New York has 29. It all depends on the population and size. The list of potential electors is approved by the party leadership of each state before the general election. In 48 out of 50 states and the District of Columbia, the winner takes all rule applies. The candidate who gets the most votes in such a state receives all the electoral votes. The exceptions are Nebraska and Maine. There, the electors are distributed proportionally to the number of votes the candidate received. Electors vote in their states. In 2024, the vote is scheduled for December 17th, after which their votes are sent to Washington. On January 6, 2025, members of the U.S. Congress will gather to count them. The results of the Electoral College vote are certified by the President of the Senate, the sitting Vice President. Surprisingly, at this point, the electors are supposed to simply duplicate the opinion of the population. But there is such a concept as a faithless elector. This is someone who voted for another candidate. The rigidity of the American system is surprising. Such a faithless elector can even be fined up to a thousand dollars. Yes, they certainly don't notice the log in their own eye. But again, this is the position of the West. It would be strange if they suddenly started to approach things objectively. But we need to manage this, of course. Point out yes, and talk about the very big problems in the so-called old democracies they call themselves. Yes, this includes the US and Britain. Indeed, the elections are very... poorly organized. Yes, there are a huge number of loopholes in the law that allow for various manipulations and enable the establishment to consolidate power and not share it with those they don't consider deserving of winning the elections. In general, the point is that elections in the West are very dirty, and we need to talk about this, of course. Surprisingly, it was precisely such a faithless elector in 2016 that allowed Trump to win. At that time, three million more Americans voted for Hillary Clinton. But there were the electors. 304 for Donald as many experts fiercely criticized the system for its archaic nature. The Electoral College was introduced at the dawn of the U.S., when small states feared that large economic centers like Chicago, New York, and Dallas would swallow their independence at the federal level through elections. In general, Biden will break his leg. It feels like this complexity is absolutely intentional. The electorate doesn't understand, they just check the box for the face on the screen. Whether Donald Trump will fulfill his promises, or Kamala Harris her threats, we'll find out only in January 2025, when Sleepy Joe is finally asked to leave the White House. Saving Private Biden in politics is no longer possible, so the public will be entertained by the renewed duo of Western democracy dancers. 
Goodbye. Thank you.